Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today um, for this session focused on sharing and learning from work underway from four citizen science projects for the reef. Um, I'm Jennifer Loder, Director of Community Partnerships at the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by five amazing citizen science champions who will share some of their work focused on the theme of pathways to impact for citizen science. On behalf of our panel, um, I'd like to start our session by extending our deepest respect and recognition to traditional owners of the Great Barrier Reef and its catchments and of all the lands upon which we're meeting today. We acknowledge that First Nations peoples are the first scientists and the ongoing custodians of land and sea country across Australia. Um, right up front, I'd just like to say that many of the results that I'll share today um, are really made possible by a range of organizations and their networks and communities delivering projects on ground. You can see some of their logos here. And just a bit of context to start our session around the sheer size, diversity, and values of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, we know that in addition to multiple more locally and regionally driven threats, the greatest threat facing the reef and its future is climate change. And we have a decade of opportunity to help shift the current trajectory. As such, empowering, <laughs> empowering people that live near the reef and, and those who don't that are compelled but to can, protect yeah, this extraordinary icon is both critical and challenging. From my perspective, citizen science offers one of the pathways for community to actively engage. So I can't see Alex. Providing though. a way for people to learn about the reef, understand the issues and viable solutions and build their own capacity and networks to help be advocates for change. No. Citizen science Should offers a platform mm -hmm. for many different types of individuals and organizations to find right. ways to work yeah, together. Yeah. Uniting traditional owners, scientists, NGOs, managers, community members to collect information that can help inform solutions. And as someone who's been working in this space for over a decade, myself and, and I'd say many of my colleagues are becoming increasingly interested in how we can find ways okay, for citizen science to continue strengthening its impact to help drive positive change. So the projects that you'll hear from today are from a set of 15 citizen science projects funded in 2019 um, to engage the community in um, data collection and sharing to increase understanding about the condition of reef habitats and species in the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area um, and adjacent catchments. Um, when we talk about the reef, often things like coral and fish will spring to mind, but the GBR is made up of many habitats and species. So the 15 funded projects covered a range of topics. Um, some focused on corals, seagrass, mangroves, turtles, species range shifts, and water quality. To date, um, and some projects are still going, these projects have helped to collect over a million data points and through more than 500 field days, they've engaged over 14,000 people um, getting involved in collecting information, training and sharing results. Um, and uh, to help support this, there've been over 100 information exchange initiatives helping to bring together key people and groups to plan, share and, and learn from the work. Um, Importantly, so far, the projects have enabled 12 instances of community data being used for, for management or to drive change on ground. So there are four key types of broad areas of data use or impact. These include um, citizen science data contributing to wildlife management. So we've seen turtle data being used to help implement and measure different types of conservation actions, such as providing surveillance that helps to activate responses for coral eating, crown of thorns, starfish control activities. Um, there are examples of projects supporting community advocacy efforts, such as protecting places and infrastructure that are important to the local community. Um, and we've had examples of citizen science programs contributing to lines of evidence um, for trying more effective policy and regulation approaches for beach use to protect turtles. We've also seen examples of citizen science data being used to complement other research data to report on the health of um, local and, and regional priorities through platforms such as the five healthy waterway regional report cards that operate across the GBR areas. Um, you'll hear a bit more about one of these projects today. There have been some amazing achievements and also recognition of much greater potential. Um, I'd say many of us here at this conference would recognize that the path to impact for citizen science data isn't always clear and easy. So today, I'm joined by partners from four projects, 
who will share their work, their achievements and reflections on um, various pathways to project impact for citizen science programs. Um, Fair Reef Foundation is really proud of all the projects we're supporting and, and I had the tough job of narrowing it down to these four, but you'll find that each of these initiatives shares a really great example of how they're helping strengthen impact for citizen science um, and also really illustrate the diversity of approaches um, in, in trying to, to deliver change. So thanks in advance to each of our speakers for sharing their time and their insights with us. Uh, after we hear from each of our four speakers, we'll have the chance for a question and answer session. So audience members can ask questions of individual presenters or of the panel. Um, so please feel free to be popping those um, in the chat as we go and we'll cover them at the end. Um, so um, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to our first presenters. Um, so Chuck McKenzie, um, and Alex Sinchak. Uh, so Jock is a tidal wetland ecologist and science communicator uh, with over 15 years experience in field ecology. He's the co-founder and co-director of Mangrove Watch and is currently wetlands program manager at Earthwatch Australia. Alex Sinchak is a projects and events coordinator at the Kansan Far North Environment Center with a degree in geography and environmental science with a focus on sustainability and is the project lead for collaborative on-ground Mangrove Watch activities in North Queensland. They'll be sharing with you a talk about how citizen science pathways to impact um, are being delivered by giving mangroves their first health check in North Queensland. Over to you, Jock and Alex. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. So I'm here today to tell you about the amazing Cairns and Far North Queensland Mangrove Watch program, a uh, citizen science partnership between Mangrove Watch uh, and the Cairns and Far North Environment Centre um, and lots and lots of community science partners. Um, so I'll be talking about the science and the science impact of the program and then handing it over to Alex to have a chat about the community and um, engagement impact of the program. So without further ado, we'll jump into mangroves. Um, I assume I'm talking to a fairly knowledgeable audience, so you'll know that mangroves are important, but if you've eaten a fish or a prawn lately, then um, it's likely that there's a little bit of mangrove in you because most of the seafood that ends up on our plate depends on mangroves in tropical and subtropical environments. But they are also highly valuable. Being trees that live on the, the sea edge, they are very susceptible to the impacts of climate change, particularly sea level rise. And then on top of that, there's all the things that people are doing. So there's uh, altered hydrology, vehicle impacts, cattle grazing, um, barriers to mangrove migration where sea level rise, all those things add up. And on top of the uh, natural pressures that mangroves face, they, this reduces their resilience to withstand the pressures of climate change. So despite our knowledge of their importance and value, we're not very good at managing them. And these issues require local management. So like Dr. Carl said in the, the um, keynote the other night that Climate change is a national federal issue, but these local issues can be dealt with at a local scale by local people. But unfortunately, the tools available to managers at the moment um, generally is all about change in mangrove extent. Um, so they just look at how much mangrove has changed over time and whether that's uh, increasing or decreasing. But you can see from those pictures there, there's lots of dead mangroves that have occurred uh, around Queensland in the last few years, and these are still mapped as being present mangroves. So the habitat quantity does not equate to habitat quality. And that's why we formed Mangrove Watch. It's all about educating, engaging, and empowering local communities to advocate for better tidal wetland management through monitoring and experiences. And the primary tool we use for that is the shoreline video assessment method, uh, which is just a fancy way of saying people go out in boats with a GPS and a video camera and a still camera, and film the shoreline. They don't need to know anything about mangroves and there's no subjective decision-making, but it does mean that through the video camera recording their voice and some note-taking that we can record local knowledge along the way. And that's really important because I can see that mangroves might be unhealthy, but someone with local knowledge can say why they died, when they died and what it means to them. And that's a really important aspect of the citizen science community partnership. So we take that video, we break it into one second still frames and we match it to shoreline position. So we have geo-referenced uh, imagery that is a long-term visual database of uh, shoreline habitat condition. And from there, we can make a criteria-based visual assessment of key indicators of mangrove habitat 
uh, condition and health and processes that are affecting those mangroves, so structure, um, condition, shoreline processes, and things that people are doing. And we can combine that to an overall shoreline habitat score ranging from A to E. And these habitat indicators have been developed specifically to be incorporated into the reef report card framework. So through the North Queensland Mangrove Watch Program, there's been uh, seven estuaries surveyed over the last couple of years and over 350 kilometres of shoreline film, and that's a huge community effort. And from that, we've developed the first baseline of mangrove condition in these estuaries. I, I have a hard time hearing you because and I so overlaps with what they're saying. We've got, um, when I'm in the can use this room, information I'll be able to, to hear other people. Feed into the Wet Tropics Healthy Waterways report card. Yeah, well, and in the main room. These, these mangrove indicators have been designed to provide a more granular, informative, and responsive okay. approach to assessing right, GBR tidal wet conditions that leads to now, better so outcomes and you. management. And so that way we can harness the power of citizen science that, and use that to assess the vast spatial scale of reef estuaries and also provide a platform okay, for thanks. knowledge transfer to inform reef management. So I'll now hand over to Alex to talk about the uh, citizen science engagement outcomes. Thanks, Jock. Um, so yeah, so since 2019, CAPNIC has worked with volunteers and local partners to film these seven estuaries from the Starkey River up in Cooktown down to Victoria Creek and Ingham near the Hinchinbrook Channel. Um, over 350 kilometers of shoreline have been filmed with the SVAM method to develop these habitat scores that we just saw. Um, one of the project impacts we can be proud of is that indicator Jock just mentioned. Um, we've engaged with over 323 scientists um, across multiple sectors. We've been very fortunate to have formal and informal partnerships with these organizations that you see. Um, these are land care, coast care, um, and um, uh, Aboriginal corporations and Indigenous land and sea ranger organizations. Um, uh, so um, another project, uh, actually, Jock, you can go to the next slide. Um, another project impact story um, is the uh, campaign to save the Jack Barnes Mangrove Boardwalk uh, from closure after its lease had run out. Uh, CAFNIC worked with uh, dedicated volunteers in the community to garner support and petition for its repair as a cultural icon, uh, basically through interest from the Mangrove Watch program. Uh, in May 2021, uh, Cannes Regional Council voted unanimously to $60,000 uh, to the Boardwalk's repair. Um, led by the Yerrigangi and Indigenous Ranger Program, uh, which is one of our partners. Um, we're very happy that they are able to lead this initi initiative through um, and enhance that traditional owner autonomy in land management. Um, finally, uh, Jock, next slide. Um, a final uh, project impact story we're happy to report on is um, the citizen science has led to species discoveries in Cairns. Uh, uh, Hitotoshi Kudo has discovered a previously unknown hybrid species of mangrove uh, just north of the city, and he consulted with the local Iraganji traditional owners to name the new species Gregaria ex Dengara. Uh, Dengara is, a, is an indigenous word meaning belonging to Machen's Beach area. Machen's Beach is one of the northern beaches um, in Cairns. Um, Hitotoshi also confirmed the presence of the rarest mangrove, uh, the Haynes orange mangrove in Australia, um, and extended the range flexed orange mangrove, another 200 kilometers south of the Cape York region. Um, next slide, please. Um, so mangrove conservation uh, is enhanced, ultimately enhanced by citizen science, what we're finding through this project. Um, these are just some benefits that citizen science brings to the table through the CAFNIC program. Uh, citizen science does contribute to hard data um, uh, for more informed decision making around the um, effectively, around effectively managing threats to tidal wetlands, uh, but it's also much more than that. Um, community awareness, increased environmental stewardship, uh, local knowledge transfer, and traditional owner authority in management are made possible through community science partnerships. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and so these are ways that you can get involved with either um, CAFNIC or with Earthwatch. Um, we've got our contact details for both of them. Um, and uh, we're also on social media. You can follow us for opportunities with us directly um, at the regional level up here in uh, Cairns and far north Queensland if you're in between Cardwell and Cape York. And Jock, if you want to take it over, um, I think we'll wrap things up. Well, just to say thank you, uh, particularly to say thanks to all the wonderful citizen scientists that have contributed to this program and that 
Uh, it's really amazing to work with a program that is delivering real outcomes for reef management. So by incorporating this data into the report card framework means that this can be communicated back to management outcomes for the reef. And of course, tidal, healthy mangroves mean a healthy reef. So, and thank you to the uh, Great Barrier Reef Foundation for supporting this program. Thank you so much, Jock and Alex, for um, sharing about the Mangrove Watch work in front of Queensland. Um, up next, we've got Erin Peterson, um, who's the owner of EP Consulting in Brisbane, where she leads a small team of data scientists working to improve the way we measure, assess, and report on terrestrial marine and riverine ecosystem health. Over the last 10 years, her work is increasingly focused on the next generation of environmental monitoring where data captured using new technologies and or citizen scientists can be used to support data-enabled management decisions. The report that she'll be sharing some results from today is part of a project led by Great Barrier Reef Legacy, um, exploring how multiple reef citizen science data sets can be collected and integrated. And she'll be sharing with you a talk about how tackling challenges and opportunities um, in citizen science data sets is part of the pathway to impact. Over to you, Erin. Uh, we did a lot more than this than I can fit in in 10 minutes, um, but I'll talk to you a bit about um, the similarities and differences in what uh, a suite of 12 different citizen science programs collect, um, the added value of citizen science data when we try to go and try to predict ecosystem health, and also some simple tips about data formats that make um, it easier for organizations outside of your own to use your data. So we started with a desktop summary of these 12 programs on the left, and we focused in on what were the program goals, uh, what type of data did they collect, how did they collect it, um, how did they store it and cure it, how easy is it to access the data outside of that organization, and also the level of training required for their volunteers. So this is just a really high level summary of what the different programs collect. And they're sort of broken into habitats, biodiversity, water quality, and impacts. And the first thing that I notice when I look at this is that, you know, you have a few programs like Reef Check Australia or some of those run by Grabumpa where they collect a lot of different measures across these different aspects of ecosystem health. Whereas there down here, you have um, programs such as Mangrove Watch, Tangora Blue, and Project Manta that really focus in on specific aspects of ecosystem health. And then when you go to compare across programs, you very quickly see that there are a few programs that are collecting similar data about similar aspects of ecosystem health. So, I mean, the highlight here is that there are a lot of similarities between these programs, but then there are unique differences as well. So then we took a closer look at three programs that collected benthic cover data. So things like percent hard coral or soft coral. So we looked at Reef Check Australia, RAPID, and RIS data, um, the latter two from Grabumpa. They all collect these data. Um, but when you look at these data that are collected in the same location, you see that they're not really comparable uh, between programs. So you start to see some very dramatic differences in the measurements that they have. And this is not surprising um, because each program uses a different method to collect their data that was designed to meet their program needs. So ReefCheck is sampling across transects, uh, RAPID and RIS are collecting over areas, but those areas that they're surveying are different in extent. So they're really not comparing apples to apples when you try to just simply combine these data across programs. So the second question was, are these citizen science data actually related to ecosystem health measures um, that we use? So we, I went out and sourced um, the coral cover score that's used in the GBR Reef Water Quality Report Card for these uh, seven reefs shown in yellow um, from 2006 to 2019. And then I went to Reef Check, uh, Coral Watch, and Grabumpa um, Rapid Programs and sourced all the data that they had for those reefs during those years. I fit models to the data. They were linear mixed effects models. 
um, to each of those data sets separately. So I'm going to show you just the Reef Check Australia. So this is a conceptual model of the final model. So here we have coral cover score that we're trying to predict. Um, and as expected, the reef where the data were collected, the year it was collected, were very important when you were trying to explain coral cover score. Uh, we found that sand uh, had a negative impact on coral cover, but that's not surprising because it's a proportion. The interesting part is that the impact data, these two measures of impacts that Reef Check Australia um, measures, had a significant relationship. So the dis percent diseased coral population had a negative impact on coral cover score, while the Triton count found on the survey had a positive impact. So we went ahead and fit models with and without Reef Check Australia data, and we found that including that citizen science data in the model improved the accuracy of our coral cover predictions by almost 20%. Um, and I was really pleasantly surprised to find that that was the case for all three citizen science programs. Um, um, so, you know, through this experience, you know, I myself had to work to bring those data sets together. Um, and so um, we were really curious about what some of the challenges were to, to do this. And I guess I want to acknowledge from the beginning that um, it's not appropriate to pull together citizen science uh, data from every program, because not every program has the goal of underpinning scientific investigations or informing management actions. And that, um, doesn't mean that these data have less value. It just means that they weren't fit, aren't fit for this purpose. Um, so for those programs where it is uh, is appropriate, I was sort of surprised um, to realize that data accessibility and ownership is one of the biggest challenges. So for some programs, they don't actually own the data that their volunteers collect. And so you have to go back to each volunteer and get permission to use the data they contributed. In other cases, there's restrictions on who can use it or how it can be used. Um, and probably um, more commonly is how you get the data. So can, can a person go to a website and download it directly or must it be requested by email or phone? And if it's the latter, then that um, means that the person requesting the data has to do that multiple times. And it also increases the workload of the citizen science organization because they're constantly responding to data requests. In some cases, there are data sensitivities. So for example, REDMAP um, sources data from recreational fisher women and men. So uh, those prize fishing spots are sensitive. So they agree not to share the location of those uh, fish sightings for two years. Um, and so that, you know, that um, means that those data can't be shared. And then finally, when you get to the subset of um, data sets where you do have access, you do have, um, it's not sensitive and you can um, obtain it, each data set comes in a really unique format and the time it takes to combine those data sets can't be underestimated. So um, these are some of the simple tips for data storage that I thought I would pass on. If you're in an organization where you want people external to you to use your data, and these are things that don't require huge changes. So the number one thing is to include metadata um, with every data download or data supplying data. So this means like clearly define every column name. Provide links to how the data were collected, how it was aggravated or ag aggregated, or how it was collect calculated after people submit it to you. Um, store the spatial locations, the lats and longs, with the data rather than in a separate file. Um, column names, um, shorter is always better. So adult cots is better than adult cots observed during the survey. Um, Define the measurement units in the metadata, not the column name. So here, in this example, media macroalgae, yes, no, that yes, no doesn't need to be in that column name. Um, avoid things like spaces, special characters, and things like that in the column names because that wreaks havoc for um, some software programs where you're trying to pull it together. When it comes to data values, uh, avoid storing the units in a numerical field. So what I mean by that is here in this example, if slime amount is defined as a percentage in the metadata, don't 
include the percent symbol in this column. That's a problem. Um, if you have missing data or null values, be consistent through the entire data set about how you represent those. Um, another tip is that if you're storing time of day, store it in a 24 hour timestamp rather than a 12 hour timestamp so that you don't have to include AM and PM. So those are just some really simple things you can do to make your data easier to use. Um, so despite those challenges, I think there's huge opportunities for integrating data from multiple citizen science programs. Like I mentioned, um, all of the citizen science data um, that I tested helped predict coral cover score. Um, and the measures of impacts that these programs collected were particularly important for that. What I find exciting about that is that when you look at Reef Check, Rapid, and Coral Watch, um, they have very um, wide range of training requirements. So Coral Reef Check, you have to train for multiple days, whereas Coral Watch, almost anyone could do it coming off the street. Um, so that means that volunteers with relatively little knowledge can contribute um, about reef knowledge. Um, the diversity of those citizen science da data sets is val valuable, even though you can't compare them across programs. And overall, I think that this data is really important because it can be used to provide an early warning system, uh, fill the data gaps between uh, sites where professional monitoring teams are sampled, and helps us understand why the changes are occurring on the reef. So with that, um, thanks. talk um, is from Abby Seymour. Uh, so Abby studied in the UK um, and holds a bachelor's degree in animal behavior and a master's degree in science communication. After working in the Red Sea for a few years, she moved to Australia and started working at Reef Teach in 2013. Abby is the senior marine biologist there and is the main supervisor for interns and research projects. Um, she's going to be sharing a talk with you about enhancing citizen science pathways to impact for science and management um, by working collaboratively with end data users and exploring innovation in data collection and processing. Over to you, Abby. Here at RiftH. So Reef Teach started out in 97 as a small company just providing educational talks to tourists. In the last five years, though, we've grown into the research organisation that we are today. We run internships throughout the year and we have several research projects on the go, all with multiple partners. I've been here for nearly eight years and I run our projects. So today I'm here to talk to you about our Eye in the Reef photo point enhancement project that's been running for the last three years. So first of all, what is this project? So it is an industry first that it links gov government, science and tourism. It's long been known that government, science and tourism all help each other. Um, this project takes the best aspects of all of those parties and brings them together. By geo-referencing photos, it allows us to repeat our spots as accurately as possible, basically giving us the best data. The photos go into an artificial intelligence program and that then analyzes the coral cover. We initially focused on tourism weekly sites from um, Grumpers Eye on the Reef program, but that got expanded to cover other non-registered sites in the Cairns area just to give us the best overview of what's happening and how things are changing. Um, last year we expanded into the Southern Great Bear Reef and also right up into the Ribbon Reefs as well. So the objective of our project is to look at changes in coral cover before and after summer. As I'm sure we all know, major changes, major impacts such as bleaching events and cyclones, they're going to happen over those summer months. So if we survey before and after, we're going to get the best representation of those changes that have occurred. We are currently getting our before summer photos pretty much as we speak. Um, our team's out in the water every week at the minute collecting that data. And we've also got the boat crews collecting and getting involved as well. So the artificial intelligence estimates the coral cover from each site from those photos. Um, the photos are not only geo-referenced, but they're also taken along a set route as well, just to make it a whole lot easier to revisit. And as I said before, we get that most accurate data possible. So how did we start? So it all started, actually began with a conversation. Um, Reef Teach were on a tourism vessel with some scientists from Ames, and they were talking about the differences in the exposed side of the reef in comparison to the backside. 
and how they didn't have a lot of data from the back side of the reef, the, basically the side where tourists visit. Um, reef Teach, we realized we could help fill that gap. So having the experience, oh, sorry, everyone, having the experience that we have has meant that we understand the limitations that tourism vessels face. And it meant we could design a survey that fitted not only with Ames's objectives, but also the workings of a busy tourism vessel. Now, the majority of tourism vessels are partaking in Grumpus Eye on the Reef surveys, specifically the tourism weeklies, with many established companies filling out those surveys very, very frequently. We thought if we can increase the participation in the tourism weekly surveys, then adding 20 photos twice a year to the actual and um, to the tourism weekly, it would be pretty simple and relatively non-invasive to the general procedures. And then if we got the crew involved, it would allow Reef Teach um, to add more sites to the project because the boat crews actually take over the continuations after their initial setup. So why is there a gap? Obviously, Ames's time is extremely limited it's, and resources are limited as well. And for their long-term monitoring program, they've chosen reefs that give the best overall view of the Great Barrier Reef and also the issues facing it. And if you have a look at the picture, all of those dots are where they survey in the Cairns and Port Douglas area. And all of those locations are on that exposed side of the reef. So we come into this because we're positioned perfectly to do that research. We all have experience in tourism. And over the years combined, we've actually spent more days in the water than on land. We understand the research side of things and we know how the tourism vessels work. So for our partners, um, we partner in this project with both Grimper and Ames. And the whole point of this project is that we didn't want to reinvent anything. We didn't think there was much point in creating multiple new survey methods if there's an existing one that's frequently used and works perfectly for the project that you're wanting to use it with. If we use the same methodology as others, our data is directly comparable. And so it's much easier to be used by multiple different parties. Um, we use the same artificial intelligence as other projects that Ames currently is running. Um, so it's reliable in that way. And then Ames can use it easily because it's a tried and tested method. Obviously, as well, it aligns with our tourism weekly surveys that the um, boats already do. And that just gives the project even more value. Now, tourism, it's long been known that, well, tourism, they really are, they're a perfect research partner. Tourism crews, they are out on the reef every single day. They know their sites like the back of their hand. If even one coral gets bleached or something tiny changes, you can bet the majority of crews, a majority of crew members are actually going to be able to recognize this. So we thought let's take advantage of that knowledge and that experience, um, not only in ways like Tourism Weekly and I and the Reef are doing, but in a slightly more detailed way as well. So we understand that running of an average day. And so we've designed that methodology to be as minimal as possible. Wherever practical, we actually go in and set up the survey ourselves. We'll then do a handover to the crew. Um, the nominated crew, so operators tend to nominate a specific crew member and that crew member tends to be a master reef guide anyway. So they do have that slightly higher level of knowledge. So it makes life a little bit easier. Once the survey is set up, to do repeats, it is fast, it's efficient. We have streamlined it as much as physically possible, to, but still getting good results, which is handy. So where does artificial intelligence come into it? Um, we really truly believe that artificial intelligence, it, it's, the, uh, it's the future of coral monitoring. It just makes life so much easier. Um, the picture you can see is actually a screen grab from the program that we use. And what it does, it randomly generates those spots, and that's how we work out the coral cover. It allows us to have a much larger raw data set as analysis is immediate, accurate, and it doesn't rely on having enough time available or having you know, interns or grad students available to actually come and analyze it in person. Raw data is very easily accessible and can be used in lots of different projects. It all fits back into the idea that this particular project is a real collaboration. We want to aid other investigations to help the environment as much as we can, basically. Um, it allows us to uncover trends, patterns, insights much faster, um, which then allows you to carry on making informed decisions. Now, where is this training tool? Um, you wouldn't think necessarily that an artificial intelligence would be used as a training tool for ourselves. But not only do we have to train the machine, but in that training, we can use that in itself as a training method. 
Um, over the last two years, we've been training this um, program. Um, it probably would have been a little bit shorter, but we did have a slight worldwide incident in the middle. Um, but we've been using it as a teaching tool for our interns. Helping them recognize various growth forms of coral and other substrates is absolutely invaluable for many of them as they all wish to go on to become marine biologists themselves. And skills such as these don't really get taught at university. There's obviously limited time and they have to focus on other things. So identification does tend to get overlooked at university and we can help with that. So where our project is also quite innovative is that it focuses on the crew members as well as the real citizen science scientists. So we love being able to get the crew involved at a level of monitoring that hasn't been seen before. The Tourism Weekly project is a fantastic tool that shows trends in reef health as it aims to collect around 40 surveys every single year. By adding that visual element to it twice a year, it really allows management to see changes over those high risk months for a reef. By handing it over to the crew of each boat once it's established, it gives them that ownership that they need to continue collecting that data. Not only does it give them ownership, but it also enhances the crew's knowledge and confidence around their reef. That then enables them to give guests a real regenerative tourism experience. And then finally, how is this data being used for management? So the Tourism Weekly data is being used by Grumpa to recognize trends in reef health and make decisions on how best to manage our changing reefs. The photo point data itself is gonna be used by AIMS in their long-term monitoring program, and therefore in turn gonna be used to supplement data that they use in publications, also in the data they present for the continued monitoring of the reef. Um, and then obviously we hope to publish later down the line as well. So it'll be used for that. And you never know management on that side of things. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope you find our project as interesting as, uh, as we do. If you do have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them in our panel discussion. Thank you, Abby. Um, and our last presenter today is Rebecca Finch, uh, who is the engagement manager at Fitzroy Basin Association. She leads a team of staff who know that people and their behaviors are key determinants of any long-term environmental solution. Rebecca's background in local and state government and in community-based organizations has equipped her with a unique perspective on the role of local decision makers and the power of collaboration. Science and data are key, but how accessible this is and what people do with it is even more important. Uh, she'll be sharing a talk with you today about bringing together citizen science with behavior change activities to support conservation outcomes as a pathway to impact. Over to you, Rebecca. Great. Hi, everyone. I haven't done one of these presentations for a while, so I'm super excited to share this story with you. <clears throat> so it's predominantly about Team Turtle CQ, which is in central Queensland. Uh, we had the Capricorn Coast and the Curtis Coast beaches that really were a gap in the Queensland Turtle Monitoring Program. Uh, and so that's kind of how we seeded the project about five years ago. Uh, and we've had quite a few different investors and supporters in the time of the project, and every year is a little bit different. So that's what I'll try and give you some insight into today. It's definitely uh, a citizen science project, which is pretty much run by volunteers. And if we didn't have volunteers, this project wouldn't happen. Just trying to change my slides. Okay. Uh, so that's a little pretty picture of all of our volunteers on the Capricorn Coast. Um, they are trained, we do a code of conduct with them, like it's quite a streamlined program. Um, basically they walk the beaches, so their main job is walk the beach, collect data. Uh, and we've even collected non-data as well, so when they don't see things, so when they don't see a track, uh, we've even been through a year where we collected non-data to examine the difference that that made to our data sets, um, because no data also tells a story. Uh, what we didn't really anticipate, I guess, at the start of this project was, it was an environmental project for us, but it wasn't really seen as a human and social project. And I would say that it's completely married now. So all of those aspects are equally important for everyone that participates in or manages the project. Uh, so there's a little evolution story to the project. 
Uh, so we started it to fill a data gap and we've actually um, got the Queensland Turtle Conservation Program very happy uh, with the level of data that we collect. So we work quite closely with them because we want it to add value and we want it to dovetail directly into their database. Um, and that also includes, many of you might know the Monrepo program. So, you know, we're linking in with the staff who work through that program as well. Uh, so we use a BioCollect app uh, and that's the tool that the volunteers use on the beaches. We obviously for accessibility also have paper version um, and we have a coordinator that can help our volunteers um, log data if they need it. And we have a um, what we call our turtle guru <laughs> or our turtle scientist who guides anyone um, and checks the data for quality to make sure when we're saying it's a log ahead track, then it's a log ahead track. Um, so what we found was that our data started showing things to us. So we saw what was predating on the nests. And, and obviously we can see as we walk a beach, we can see other threats like marine debris um, or full drive use of beaches. Uh, so that's actually led to um, very passionate volunteers starting a lot of conversations and there was some instances where they tried to encourage that kind of behavior especially for drive driving on beaches to stop um, but what it's led to is a complementary fox control program uh, with the local governments involved on those capricorn and curtis coasts uh, so that's been quite pleasing uh, and then what it then led to was we didn't want to make any assumptions about uh, full drive behaviour and why people might full drive on a beach and therefore how could we ask people not to drive on the beach. Uh, so FBA looked at some focus groups with full drive user groups. Uh, we did some basic surveys. Uh, we did beach observation where staff sat on beaches and counted the number of vehicles and all of that data informed a report. So whilst it wasn't really new data, it was kind of self-assuring to sort of realise that what people were thinking about access was correct, but it also busted a couple of myths. So whilst there's often a lot of community angst, particularly on the Capricorn Coast, which doesn't have a permitted system, um, are, so there's some angst around stopping people driving but the, and, and telling locals this message. But what we found with our data was that it's not the locals who are necessarily accessing, accessing the beach quite regularly. And we looked at a compliance data as well from the local government. So they um, obviously have local laws about beach access and when they were fining people, they can look at where those registrations come from. And so it was quite interesting to put both data sets together and inform the discussion. So that led, led to some agency conversations about this is the data that we have. What data do you have? What problems are you experiencing? This is how the community is feeling, um, representing our volunteers and giving them a voice. Um, and so that led to some very simple solutions, which was just around, well, the police can't put compliance in place or fine people on the beach if there's no speed sign within 100 metres. So the local government put up their hand and put speed signs all along the beach. So that immediately gave um, some feelings of reassurance and being listened to by the community and, some, and our passionate volunteers. Um, and where it's extended to now is, um, you know, we've had opportunities for our volunteers. All the little hearts on that diagram there are our volunteers growing. So every year we get more and more and it's leading to diversity in how we can provide volunteer opportunities. So we've now got people who are trained in marine strandings and they um, play a role for the Department of Environment and Science in responding to those strandings and recording data. Uh, and then the very new thing is uh, on the Capricorn Coast, we took part in the GBRF um, community action planning and there was a group of younger people who wanted to be part of volunteering or contributing to turtles on the coast. And so we're seeing team hatchlings now emerge and design their own kind of project activities around stewardship and education. Uh, so the community-based social marketing approach we took uh, was all about us just making sure we were being really human-centered. 
So as I've mentioned before, we did some observational data, we did some focus groups, and then what the result when we unpacked that with our project partners was, was we decided to put in signage, which was quite an interesting decision because we had many stakeholders saying, why would you put more signage in? No one is seeing the signage. But what it actually, what we did was put cameras on the signage so we could track the interaction. And we did prove that in a short time variation, people notice new signs and they will interact with them. So whilst it had a different approach, um, the old signs you know, may not be serving a purpose, but if you're regularly changing signs or you're giving other people somewhere to go with their information or interact with it, you're more likely to get an outcome. So that sign we're now considering uh, with the local government moving around to local events that happen um, and extending the message about driving safely on beaches for the purposes of turtles and other wildlife. Uh, so I guess the learnings for us are really around the diversity and the growth that can happen in a citizen science program. You know, you might think it's just about data and collecting data, which is valuable in itself for, you know, improving or decreasing threats and improving the viability of some of our special species, but it's much, much more. And it often gets talked about from a connection point of view. But I also think it's important to say that it provides a voice. So for many of our passionate volunteers, you know, they're willing to contribute and they want to contribute, but what they find really disheartening, and I guess that would speak to maybe why you might experience in some volunteer programs some decline, is because if then there's an issue and nothing gets done about it or there doesn't seem to be a solution, um, that can be really frustrating. And so what we've done with all of our project partners and because we've had a stakeholder group and because we've been so open in sharing that data, is that we've been able to give a voice to both community, but balance it as a very legitimate voice. Um, and then take everyone's role because there's so many agencies that are involved in a beach env environment and how people use it. But just sharing the problems easily came up with some little solutions and things that could be done. Uh, and there's such positivity around that. So I think that's our biggest lesson really. Um, and just the diversity of roles. So we've gone from people who collect data on beaches to people who help with marine strandings to in the Team Hatchlings program now, which is all about some of our older volunteers linking up with younger volunteers and going out, whether it's at events, whether it's at schools, and doing some of the stewardship and education on a local basis. And they've already started doing that. That began with just some of our volunteers saying, hey, we'll talk about Team Turtle CQ at that event that you can't get to FBA. Um, so it really extends the project outcomes and the reach that we can achieve. Um, so yeah, um, thank you very much for listening. I hope that was a nice heartwarming story for everyone. And we do, we are very grateful for all the different um, stakeholders that support this project over its life, which includes Great Barrier Reef Foundation. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, that's a really nice um, message to close out on. I think it reiterates the, um, one of the themes of the conference around celebrating um, and, and communicating and what an important feature that is in citizen science programs. Um, we've now got about 10 minutes um, where we're going to um, bring up all of our speakers and have a bit of a Q&A session. I've been watching um, some of the questions flow through in the chat. Um, John, I think you might get the prize for the most questions. Thank you. Um, and I've got a couple of questions of my own, but we might not get to them. So let's see how we go. Um, and the, the first one in here um, is from John. Uh, and I think this question is probably specifically meant for Rebecca, but maybe if anyone else um, would also like to jump in, do you engage with other community-based organizations such as Scouts, Rotary, Lions, et cetera? Yeah, um, so probably potentially not really Scouts. Like I imagine there'll be a tar key target audience for us when we're, but who we do engage with is those other community groups who are in that beach space. So into our stakeholder meetings, we've brought 
you know, a group, a Capricorn Coast Land Care Group. Uh, we've brought bird life Capricornia in, just so we're all equally aware of what each other is trying to do in those spaces. And, you know, even Surf Riders Association has been at those meetings and it's been so valuable to have them around the table with the agency staff. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. Did anyone else want to jump in? Um, I'll just jump in with my recent experience and that I had a chance to um, do a presentation about citizen science for one of the Rotary Club networks um, and the amount of enthusiasm and interest was incredible. So I think it's definitely a great network to tap into if you're looking to extend reach. Great question, John. Um, also a question about, um, I guess, perception and, and feedback and response uh, for the Team Turtle program about um, how the four wheel drive communities responded both to the, the signage and, and the process around developing it. Yeah, there was some, it wasn't as a result of the project, but it shows how carefully you need to manage me, media messaging. Um, the media did do a story that we weren't part of as part of our project. And the, there was a community up towards Bifrox in Byfield, which is at the north of the Capricorn coast, and they did get offended. They did feel targeted and blamed. Um, and we had discussions with the police <laughs> about that, who alerted it to us. Um, so whilst that was really unfortunate, it really had nothing to do with the program, but we put in some protocols with all of our um, volunteers. And, and that's also what we discuss in the stakeholder meetings is that consistency of messaging and sharing the data that sometimes our locals are not the ones who are, I guess, disrespecting um, or not thinking about how they drive on the beach. That was quite an important reinforcement. Yep, fair enough. And um, yeah, I think it, you know, it does really go to show that, um, I guess the opportunity that um, citizen science and some of these translation of citizen science initiatives into doing that the platform that that can provide to bring people together, but that the, the way in which we kind of share and, and talk about that needs to be done. Um, pretty sensitively to, to bring everyone along on the journey. Um, but a question here about, oh my goodness, and now there's heaps of questions popping up. Um, question from Lisa um, about, and this will be for the, the broader panel, I think probably mainly for Abby and maybe Aaron to start. What do you think about the, the potential for um, combining strengths of um, AI and citizen science? Do you want to kick us off, Abby? The potential is huge because, I mean, because it is such an immediate analysis, it's, if you collect it and, I mean, there's lots of different AI programs that all kind of do a similar thing. So it just does depend on which one you do, but there is, the data is comparable from all of them because you're still collecting the same sort of thing. So, I mean, the comparison side of things, obviously that's much more, Erin's field, but I think the potential is huge. It, it, like unlimited, because obviously the AI is getting faster and better every single time. We're seeing it every day when we make like minor corrections. We're seeing within five minutes, all of a sudden everything's changed and the AI is figuring things out that it wasn't five minutes ago. So it's it it's a fantastic tool, I think. Okay, Erin. Yeah. Um, I guess I would just add to that that um. You know, something like AI is really critical when you start collecting data using new technology. So, when I, you know, images are essentially, you know, we can, people can take cameras underwater now, you know, everybody's walking around with a camera on their phone. And so you have this massive volume of data coming through. Um, and without AI, you can't really process that data fast enough and do something with it. Like a single person just can't check all those images. Uh, so I think it's really critical and exciting, but what it also means, I think, you know, for what Jock was talking about or Abby, having a video or an image, there's an underlying truth, and that creates a lot more trust in the data that, that people are collecting because you can go back and check it. So I think that's really exciting, and it doesn't take a lot of skill to take a good video or photo. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wants to jump in, jump in there around how you're using um, imagery in your citizen science data collection? Jack? Just that, yeah, because we have uh, thousands of hours of video, which um, at the moment we 
segmented so it's only small portions of the coastline that we do like a, a point transect along a shoreline but um, there are certainly opportunities to feed that into ai and we're talking with ibm to do that because it's um yeah that's that's the future i think having that immediate connection from the citizen science data collection to some output that can be visualized uh, without going through too much processing which is, for me is a big part of the citizen science challenge is the the quantity of data um, and, but obviously you still need the scientists overlooking that and feeding the the information in there but it um i think that yeah ai is the the way to go Jen, could I just add one more thing? Um, as exciting as AI is, you know, it still it still doesn't do as good a job as like a marine scientist sitting there and picking. So really, I think the sweet spot for AI would be if we could have citizen scientists helping to train train that, like Abby was talking about. So don't disconnect the people from the AI, but find a way to, to have both contributing because humans can still distinguish between objects a lot better than AI can. So, um, and then you get the engagement and the education like Abby was talking about. That's a great point, Erin, and is probably a really nice segue for um, a question that came in for Abby um, around if tourists are getting involved in, in the data collection or if it's, um, mainly just focused on, on operators? Yeah, so um, that very much depends on the operator themselves. Some operators, their insurance don't let them, um, doesn't let them get tourists involved in it. It has to be boat crews. But a lot of operators are kind of including it in their snorkel tours. So, for instance, they're going around and saying, okay, well, I'm going out and taking these photos for this project why don't you come along with me and I'll show you the photos that I'm taking? Because then they're not getting the tourists directly involved. They're not putting them at risk by having the cameras taking the photos of specific ones because there is some duck diving involved normally. So they're getting them involved in a indirect way. So they're still explaining the project. So it's much more focused on getting the crew members involved as the citizen science scientists, but say some operators are also involving the crew in an indirect way, uh, the tourists in an indirect way. Um, and then we've got a, a kind of comment in here from Susan about, a, I guess, a call to arms um, on more opportunities for Norfolk Island um, to connect in with citizen science programs. Um, so Susan might want to pop that in one of the network chats for the conference and see if you can make some connections about getting that off the ground. Um, we've got about two minutes left in our session um, and I just thought I might close out um, with with one of my questions um, we do have a little bit of flexibility in the session there's nothing on after us so you know if people did want to stick around that might be an option but also know that um, there's only so many hours people can spend on zoom so we will try to wrap up on time um, so just wanted to close out with a question for all of our um, wonderful speakers and panel members um, about one learning or piece of advice um, that you'd like to, to share with the audience um, around pathways to impact for citizen science. And I might get Jock to kick us off. Yeah, well, I think that um, the learning I have is sitting down the bottom of the screen there, that it's, um, it's essential to have strong local partners assist in delivery of a program when you're delivering a citizen science program from a hub somewhere remotely, um, that having a person like Alex delivering that project, making the local connections and driving up local support creates so many opportunities and networks that you can't do if you're not physically present in a space. Um, so I think that's, for us, that's the main, the key to success for our programs is to have a funded position, coordinated position in a local area that drives local support and, and engagement and networks. Thanks, Doc. That might be a nice segue to you, Alex. Um, yeah, and I was just going to say, like, with those a relationship with partner with regional partners, um, you know, we only bring so much um, scientific knowledge to um, the project, provide like the data format that we want it in. However, 
Um, there's always feedback and local specific local knowledge that we just cannot possibly possess. We do not know the entire history of these areas that we are looking at. And so providing that traditional lens is like traditional owner lens is also really important if they're willing to engage in cultural protocols and um, share that knowledge with us. That's also really important. And then just people who have just been in the area for decades at a time that capture information that's maybe not on aerial um, aerial footage of areas that we're surveying. So, um, you know, it's no nothing, you know, it may be subjective, but it is valuable. Thanks, Alex. Abby, over to you. Um, I think it, my from my side of things, I think it relates into what Rebecca was saying, that you've really got to give the citizen scientists a sense of ownership and a sense of this is doing something. So it's it's coming it's coming to something. We're getting data out of it, and this is how we're using the data. And I think that's a crucial part of it because if they don't feel like anything's happening from it, they're going to stop. And especially like an RK dealing with crew members, they've got a, an entire tourist day to run at the same time as trying to do this. So we really have to show them. Look, I promise it's doing something. Look, this is what it's doing. Um, otherwise, work just takes over. So yeah, obviously, work should take over. But we've got to give them that extra boost. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Abby. Um, and Rebecca? Yeah. From a slightly different angle on the data sharing, it's interesting when you have an internal long term program that an organization runs because you have staff ownership over it or organizational ownership over it in addition to community ownership. And that's sometimes a tricky thing to balance. So, you can't be precious about who owns the project or who runs the project. And that for me is something that I think you have to tap into quite regularly, you know, to ensure that everyone is equally committed to moving it forward. And our ultimate um, aim for the program is to not have FBA run it. Um, so a little bit contentious, but it will be wonderful to be completely citizen led. Thank you, Rebecca and Erin. Yeah, um, I guess um, from my perspective, if your goal is to have a management act, um, impact or inform science, the easiest way to do that is to design your, your project program from the beginning. So there's a pathway for that data to be used. And Alex had, a, um, or Abby had a really nice story about talking with Ames, realizing they had a data gap and said, oh, well, we can fill that. So that program is designed to collect data that they can use. Not everybody can do that. There's lots of existing programs and it's not unheard of um, to have data from like, for example, from Reef Chalk Australia is now being used in the regional report cards. Um, but that's a lot harder to do. And so I guess in that case, I would recommend engaging with the scientific organization or management agency that you want to work with and finding out what their needs are and seeing if maybe you could collect a few more photos or a video while you're out there. Um, so have that plan from the beginning of how you're going to achieve that impact would be my my um, advice. Thanks, Aaron. That's a really nice note to wrap up on in terms of one of the conference themes around co-create and the importance of that in citizen science programs. I think we've seen some great examples from the presentations around the importance of communication and celebrating the contributions um, from communities through citizen science programs and um, the impact that it can help achieve. So a very big thank you to all of our speakers um, for sharing their stories today. Um, and a big thank you to our audience members for all of their great questions. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you for bringing Thanks. us together. Bye.